He had spent more time in the last year with his Barrett M107 than he had with his wife in their two years of marriage. He knew it better than he could ever hope to know her. He intimately understood that his U.S. Army Ranger-issued anti-material rifle weighed 28.98 pounds empty, and he knew damn well that it was more of a hindrance than a help to him if it were empty, so he had an equally intimate understanding of its 10-round detachable box magazines and each one's 4.12-pound weight. In the same way that he and his wife endured one another's flaws gleefully rather than begrudgingly, so too he gladly hauled every round he could quietly carry. In each sleek, brassy casing, he saw the potential to directly snuff out a life or spare his own, and to indirectly terminate or preserve tens or even hundreds of other lives. In his training, they explained to him that his job was that of a force multiplier, they would invest in him the tools and training needed to enable one man to do the damage of twenty or more. He did not take this investment lightly, nor did he make light of the potential for every individual round he could carry to turn the tides of battle, to serve his purpose, to save his brothers, to send himself home. Every slow squeeze of the trigger was a matter of lives and deaths so every gram of weight he could spare to make room for another round was shed without hesitation. Every motionless hour it took to line up the perfect shot was spent without complaint. It was not his mission on this day to simply execute a person or people at long range. He could have lugged a lighter rifle around this gentle sloping ridge along this winding mountain road if that had been his mission. He took great satisfaction in his specialty as an anti-material marksman. Killing a pilot of a helicopter or the driver of a truck could certainly count as force multiplier work, but he and his commanders knew that drivers and pilots were more expendable in the field than engines, so it was far more efficient to send a fifty caliber round through the latter. He took his job seriously. He could see any variety of military vehicles with a kind of X-ray vision, he knew the engines, gas lines, cargo holds, and heaviest armor points. He was a master of his craft and followed orders like a good soldier. That's why he was now on the side of a mountain in a country where he and his team technically didn't belong, on a mission that technically didn't exist, doing work for a cause in which he technically didn't believe. He was here despite all of that because he was a good soldier. He reminded himself of that while fresh air whistled over his camouflage skin. He was a part of the mountain, still as the rocky surface on which he lay. While his heavy equipment was technically capable of sending a bullet across a greater distance, he was supremely confident in his accuracy from a range of about 20 football field lengths. He wasn't that far from the road, and he was especially pleased with his positioning. The numerous rolling hills along this mountain range meant that sniper fire could be coming from any direction. There would be no obvious single location to target for retaliation. Staring through his scope, he could see gentle dust rising down the road, confirming what he thought was the sound of heavy engines. His positioning was perfect for a shot as the vehicles approached or after they'd passed. He would have relatively ample time to read the vehicle type, angle, and quantity, and get off several shots before the enemy could even register what was happening. The infantry team would move in and complete the ambush. It would be as clean as field warfare could be, and he wouldn't hesitate to take on an anti-personnel role if the circumstances required it. He had held this position for over 20 hours now. He had no spotter. This was a bare-bones, small team, top-secret mission. Loose lips sink ships, and the fewer lips, the lower the chance of any loosening. His thumb clicked off the safety as he saw vehicles rumbling over the corner thousands of yards away. He drew in a slow breath to steady his heart rate. <sighs> so many hours of waiting led him to this brief window in time. Patience was an even more important ally to him than his M107. Without his patience and concentration, the most powerful, accurate, and reliable firearms in the world would be useless in this moment. He'd been here before and channeled his experiences to replicate their successes. He would push every other thought from his mind, his wife, his home, the stiffness of the unyielding stone beneath him, the slight cramp in his thigh, 
the steady rumble in his stomach, the dirt mixed with paint on his skin begging to be washed away, the unidentified insect that landed on his neck. All of it was forced out of his brain until he could see nothing but the rolling targets and crystal clear x-rays of their internal vulnerabilities. With his target finally selected, his index finger smoothly slid over the firm trigger, prepared to aim slowly as his mind raced through calculations on his own for the wind in closing distance. He couldn't waste time or brain power wishing for a spotter. Resting on its sturdy metal bipod, his sleek 20-inch barrel hardly moved as he made his adjustments, mostly waiting for the target to move into the perfect firing position. Suddenly, a thin wisp of gray smoke, barely perceptible against the rocky backdrop, rose from the mountainside and quickly dissipated into the air. The sound of the small explosion lagged behind the supersonic metal, and its target never heard the bullet's cry. The American's body lay even more still now, beside his rifle, blood painting the mountain rock beneath it, as the armored convoy rolled on. Had his life not been so instantly terminated, had the American but one last moment to reflect on his own demise, it is likely that he would have regretted his choice of a location so ideal for snipers.